Welcome everyone. Thank you for your patience. Good to see you all yet again. Wonderful, wonderful little three-day family we have here. Large family. <laughs> it's like that big, big family party with all the extended relatives. Okay, so David's prepping a few things up front here and I'm going to, um, I'm just gonna give a little introduction for him. And let me just double check here. I have a few things I wanted to make sure I got to as well. Let's see here, David. Okay, perfect. So David Stanwood, he draws from a lifetime of experience in diversified fields like machine tool making, felt making, photography, sailing, and classical piano. While a student at North Bennett Street School, an unanswered question, hey, if the action doesn't feel right, what can I do to change it? Led him down a lifelong path of researching and developing methods for improving the feel of piano actions. Since then, he remains a pioneer in his field of piano touch weight technology. He's a recipient of the North Bennett Street School's Distinguished Alumni Award in 2007 and inducted into the Piano Technician's Guild Hall of Fame in 2019. And he has invented uh, touch weight metrology. A, a quick overview of what he's going to talk about today. Um, he's going to share his insights garnered from 42 years in the trade, uh, where you can learn how the tone of lightweight Chopin era hammers inspired the creation of great compositions. The modern day hammer is much heavier and those inspiring qualities are easily lost. Deeper understanding of the unique properties of wool felt lead to voicing methods that add tone color mm -hmm. and expand tonal range into the pianissimo. As for touch, the underlying and overriding factor is the inertia of the leveraged ham hammer weights, leverage ratio, and hammer weight levels vary widely and finding the correct match is key to producing a desired playing quality. Learn how to let the action speak for itself and get the right inertia with a straightforward calculation free approach. And uh, at this point, I'll check in over there with David. How you doing, David? I'm good, I'm here. Very good, it's good to see you. Uh, are you pretty much ready to take the reins here and, uh, and get started? Yep. All right, excellent. So I'll put you on the spotlight and just let me know if and when you need me. Did you get a chance to ship that uh, ship that file over? I did. Okay, cool. I'll check in on that and see if I can load it up where necessary. All right. Have at it. All right. Thanks, Ethan. And thank you all for coming. I'm here at my, in my home in Martha's Vineyard, it's an island not too far from uh, Boston, offshore. It's a good place to uh, fiddle around and invent things in the winter because it's quiet, or it used to be quiet before everybody in the world found out about it. But um, I've had a fair success in the field of uh, touch weight, and mainly because when I got into the field, I found that rebuilding hammers uh, and new pianos, uh, excuse me, rebuilding piano hammers, rebuilding pianos with new hammers on old pianos, uh, really was quite haphazard. Sometimes I got good results, sometimes I got bad results. And uh, when I talk to people, famous people, knowledgeable people back in the 1980s, early 1980s, uh, I really wasn't getting satisfactory answers. I, well, put the weights in the keys and make the touch weight perfect and the action will feel perfect, but that didn't seem to work. Uh, sometimes I'd be putting a lot of keys, uh, lead in the keys and others not. So my journey, as uh, Ethan said, really took me to places that I'm still going to. And in the 1990s, I started to understand the relationships between action ratio and hammer weight. And this was something that had never been studied, no information. So I, I basically was on my own. And I wanted to... Um, really gleaned from that uh, my insights uh, that will really help 
you be better piano technicians. And I'm going to start with a little PowerPoint and try to mix it up here a little bit with the uh, media. So I'm going to. Yeah, let me know if you need any assistance. Are you just showing the images at first? Or... I'm just going to do a PowerPoint and. Uh... Okay. Perfect. I can see it. Looks great. New Samic upright, unvoiced, but that was a previous slide. Now you're at the beginning. All right now, there we go. All right. So, um, Ethan, if people want to make comments, uh, do they sort of request permission from you? Is that how? It yeah, works? we can play it however you like. Uh, I'm. We can have a quick, quick overview of what you want to do. Also, I see it looks like your presentation might be zoomed in a little bit or something. We can. We can green. Uh, yeah, what is that? Do so you have a green box around it or something that's sort of a half, limiting? Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe you want to exit and come back in and make it uh, make sure you just select to share your screen so that you see the whole thing. It's, it's you're, I think you're sharing a portion of your screen. Oh, um, that's right. Music and computer sound only. Yeah, you can uncheck that. You go back to the, you go back to the main sharing window, and okay. then just share your screen like you were doing before. At this point, there you go. Now we're looking good. Yeah. In terms of questions, do you uh, do you want the questions inter interspersed? Uh, Usually, you know, we have I, them put I, them in the chat. I, I would be happy to be interrupted or people to jump in. I really okay. I it. It's not I, that it would make it feel more like a classroom to me because I okay I really encourage people to uh, jump in and ask a question or uh, that's really the most important thing. So if we okay, could, perfect. I'm gonna open it up. So so we'll have people you know at first people tend to be a little bit shy. So you could put your, your questions in the chat for David as you go. Um, if you're feeling bold and you want to just uh, hop in, unmute yourself. I've made it possible so everybody could unmute yourself you can certainly unmute yourself jump in and throw in a question or comment um and yeah, we'll just either way and i would encourage you to uh, speak up and uh because it makes me feel less isolated <laughs> yeah Be beautiful logo <laughs> what <laughs> beautiful logo oh thank you so i'll tell you about the logo barbara pease barbara renner uh barbara pease was a classmate of mine in 1978 77, 78 at North Bennett Street School. She's turned into one of the top uh, concert technicians, recording studio technicians. She lives in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, near uh, Newport. And I told her I wanted to, to have a Stanwood logo that looked like a brass inlay on a fallboard. And she said, oh, I've got a rosewood fallboard. And she's a master with Photoshop. She uh, created this image for me. And the logo itself, I just signed my name about 200 times with an ink pen and I picked out one that looked kind of like a musical clef sign. And uh, that's right. where that came from. Thank you. So I always, I always start out giving thanks to sheep because without pianos, uh, without sheep, we would not have pianos the way we know them today. The, the wool fiber, and we're gonna get into this uh, is, central to what a piano is and the tone production. So I always say, thank you. Nice. So I wanted to take a different track um, for this lecture. And I really wanted to um, relate historically to where pianos came from. I, we Sometimes it's easy to forget where we came from. And when we listen to the works of Chopin, these amazing, incredible works, and we think, well, we're playing them on pianos, but what did Chopin play? What was he inspired on? What kind of piano? And how do those relate to, how can we make modern pianos uh, inspire us the same way as those Chopin pianos uh, of that era? What is it about that piano? And I'll tell you what is very, really, really interesting. It's looking at, uh, this is a Chopin era piano. These are, this is a Playel 1845. 
and look at this hammer. It has, it has layers. It has, uh, this is a very hard leather layer at the most inner core. This is a, a hard elk skin or buck skin. It's a little bit harder than this one. And then I'm a little bit softer. I'm a little dyslexic today. I don't know why. So we got harder, softer, and then we have a softer buckskin. And then on the outside, we have a very, very soft um, wool felt that's mixed with beaver. Uh, I think there were a lot of beaver hats back then, and these felt makers would chop them up <laughs> and mix the fiber with the wool fiber. But this, this hammer is extremely light and it's extremely soft. And just out of curiosity, is that a original or is that like a remake? Or do you know where this picture came from? Um, these are original. It came from somebody in Paris. I'd have to look it up. Hmm. Wow. That's incredible. Well preserved if they're original. So we're going to go forward now. Uh, 30 years. And this person is someone to pay attention to. Uh, if you want to read about history of the modern piano, read uh, Alfred Dolge's book, Pianos and Their Makers. Um, can you all see me in at all? Yes. Yeah, we got you on a tiny little all right, so screen on the so side. You see yeah. the book here? That's Pianos and Their Makers. It's an original copy. Uh, I think it's signed. So Alfred Dulge came into the, the business uh, around 1870 and he started making felt. He came from Germany, tried to find his way in the new world in New York. And he uh, saw the need for dense hammer felt of the highest quality for piano makers. Because these, it turns out that these very, very super light multi-layered uh, hammers from the Chopin era, the manufacturers are going to higher tension, they're going to cast iron plates, they're going to uh, need a heavier hammer and a, ha and a hammer that wasn't gonna wear out. And those early hammers with the leather and the, and the soft felt were, worked beautifully for those early pianos, lower tension scales. So Dulge was right there and he, uh, he writes in his book, now this is very interesting, he writes in his book here, uh, well, he, he describes the, uh, the very hard, hard sole leather, followed by medium elk skin, then soft, and then a special, you know, he, he's talking about the layering. But Dold says this, and this is 30 years later after the, that piano, that kind of piano existed. The art in hammer making has ever been. So he's talking about hammer making. And he's saying, this is the way it is. This is the way it's ever been. It's, a, it's an important statement. I never really got the importance of those words until I started really looking this over yesterday. But the, the art has ever been to obtain a solid, solid, firm foundation, graduating in softness and elasticity towards the top surface. So there's a gradation that he's talking about, just like in the Chopin hammer. The, the top surface has to be silky and elastic in order to produce a mild, soft tone for pianissimo. So the surface is what drives pianissimo playing, but with sufficient resistance behind it to permit a hard blow of fortissimo. So what he's talking about is a, is a multi-dense hammer. And he's, he's describing perfectly the, the Chopin hammer, which has all these multi uh, layers of uh, to create a gradation, I call it a gradient of softness from the top surface into the inner of interior of the hammer. What was happening uh, when Dolge came along, he started making hammers. He designed uh, a hammer press, which became the industry standard. In fact, uh, the Dolge hammer presses were used by Steinway. And when I was visiting Steinway in the early 1980s, they were still using Dolge presses at Steinway. I think they're all gone now. Uh, but he, when you talk about hammer making in the world of pianos, Alfred Dolge is, uh, was there at the beginning. And he's an important 
person in our history. Uh, so the core concept here <clears throat> for piano hammers is they're soft on the outside and dense on the inside. And we're going to talk about how that relates to creating a Chopin sound in the modern piano. So the wool, wool felt is the only material that's durable enough to make these ideal heavier hammers that the piano makers were demanding in 1875. It, it was the only thing that it could hold up to uh, playing without wearing out. And in later years, when piano player pianos came along, that was even more stress on the hammer. If you want to wear out a hammer, you know, put it on a player piano and play it every day, all day long in a restaurant or whatever, or at home, who never. So the wool felt is really, really uh, important. Also, um, so we see here that the heavier hammers that the piano makers needed in 1875, what, how do we know if a hammer is heavy or medium or light? So we're talking about hammer weight here, progressing from the Playel period to the modern period. Um, back in 1992, when I was doing my work on hammer weights, I looked everywhere for what's a normal weight hammer. And the only thing I could find was this little graph that Harold Conklin Jr., who was a brilliant inventor and uh, worked at Baldwin for many years, uh, designing all the famous pianos at Baldwin. He was a very clever person. He has a lot of uh, patents. And this is the only thing I could find where there was any mention of hammer weight. If you talk to any manufacturer in the world and ask them what their hammer weight specifications are, you won't get an answer. There, isn't, there aren't any. They'll tell you 18 pound or gross nine or something that had to do with the sheet of felt that the hammer was made from. But it's really hard to find information on what hammers weigh. So this didn't really mean much to me. When I look at that line, it means nothing to me. So I came up with this measurement. I had to get it inventive. And I, and many of you have probably heard, seen this and practice and use it, but I'm sure there's some of you among the group here that have it. So I'm going to do a review of strike weight. So I'm going to go off screen here, off say. So am I back? Uh, You're back camera? up full screen there, yep. Okay, great. Let me get my full screen. So I have here, um, this is a touch weight metrology table. It's designed by me and it's marketed by Pianotech Supply. You can also make these jigs yourself as, as I did back in the day. Piano technicians tend to be inventive. But here we have a digital scale. And the most important thing about this digital scale is to not get one that's too accurate. You wanna get one that's accurate to a 10th of a gram because if you go more accurate than we can repeat measurements, then you're, you've got too many numbers coming at you. It's gonna be a detriment. So if you wanna get a digital scale that is accurate to a 10th of a gram. What we're gonna do, so here I am back in the nineties and I wanna know what, um, I wanna know what hammers weigh. So am I gonna to go to a concert grand and pull hammers off and weigh them? So I thought about this for a while and I realized, well, you know, when we measure touch weight, we measure down weight, we're measuring a weight at a radius of, of the at piano action where, where the keys are played. And I thought, why not take that principle extended to the hammer and we can take um, and just tip a hammer onto a scale and measure the weight. So I, this seems to work pretty well. I call it strike weight because it's actually the weight of the hammer plus the contribution of the shank that uh, hits, the, hits the string. So I'm gonna level this. I've got a little level on the shank. You can see the bubble. Yeah, that's visible. I'm doing it sort of backwards here. So I'm gonna tighten that up. So now the shank is level and we're resting on the tail. 
I got to turn the scale on. And now it's reading zero. And I'm going to put this on here. And we have uh, 11.5 grams is the strike weight. So if that's new to you, I hope you find that exciting and interesting. If it's old, it's always fun to see. Now, if you want to actually get the hammer weight, what you need to do is measure the, shank, the contribution of the shank. And one great thing about the digital scales is you can put jigs on the scale and then you can hit set the scale to zero. So I have just a little piece of, uh, just a little wedge of felt. And I'm going to Now notice that I set the flange, the flange is made vertical. If I, if it, the flange is here, it's gonna have an, a counterbalancing effect. The flange is fixed. It doesn't have anything to do with hitting the hammer so, or hitting the string. So we just tip the flange vertically and that takes that out. Now I'm gonna set this wedge um, at the point where the hammer is. And here we have, uh, 1.4 grams, which is, you find that this uh, measurement, which I call shank strike weight, because it's the strike weight, contribution of strike weight from the shank. So this shank strike weight tends to be anywhere from one to 1.4 grams to 1.9 grams. And it's interesting because sometimes you look at a large, this is a full width hammer shank. And sometimes you'll have the narrow hammer shanks that are even heavier than the the full wood, because there's variations in the density of the wood. And in fact, when I'm uh, buying a new set of shanks, of wooden shanks, I will measure all the shank strike weights and write, I write on the uh, bottom what the weight is. And then I sort them out by weight, so the weight's graduated. Any questions? I haven't seen any coming from the chat. There, right? <laughs> yeah, there is. I know it's probably yeah, David. This is Nick Letersky, I have a question. So when you when you graduate those shanks by weight, then you use the heaviest shanks for the base hammers. Is that the idea? Yes, usually. Um, and those That's narrow shanks that you find on some sets, to where the top is narrow shanks. Hmm. Each section of narrow shanks and the full shanks have to be. That's because they're stronger? They're um, meant to be lighter. They're, I think it's just right. to make a lighter, faster shank in the treble. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't want to mix, obviously, you don't want to mix sections of narrow shanks with the wide shanks. So set, sort each section. I'm sorry. Let me clarify my question. So the heavier shanks you use on the base end, is that to make them stronger to support heavier hammers? Oh, that might be an added benefit, but what I'm looking for is weight calibration. Okay. And All right. We'll talk, we'll talk more about that. But the one of the core concepts of uh, uniform inertia and uniform voicing is a smooth and consistent weight that's hitting the string. So the shank strike weight contributes to the weight of the hammer hitting the string. So we want to make sure that there's no bumps in the road. Okay. David. Yep. I think quite some time ago in a, a Rappaport hands-on class, they were rolling the uh, shanks across the table. Um, oh, the uh, uprights, upright shanks. Yes, I think they were. Yeah, the uh, friends might not roll that well. <laughs> oh, okay. right, right, yeah. Right, obviously. Thanks, oops. <laughs> what was that? Was that some sort of uh, try to measure their something about their consistency or what was the purpose of rolling them? They wanted the same thing, stronger ones in the base. Uh, Are they listening the to um, a sound of the shank hitting the? No, it had to do with the weight. I think it was with warpage too. Is it? To see if they, they were warped. 
by rolling them on the table if they, if they had any warpage and also the sound to see if they were hollow sounding they would go on the treble more you know um it's a it lot of years be, ago it, it was, was a lot a of long years ago. ago yeah, yeah. i remember <laughs> <laughs> well it's interesting uh just bringing these points up uh, is that arlen yeah yes, that was arlen. arlen recognize your voice um i guess i can say hi david hey. you know when i visited these german factories um, steingraber Sauter, um they and and talking to paul mcnulty who, who builds I think he just built a Chopin era piano and the Forte pianos. And they listened to the, they tune the shanks by tone. They listened to the shank. And Steingraber there, they would put the shanks on a rail with no hammers on them and they would hit them with a little hammer. And it, if it didn't have the right sound, it would go out in the back. Ah. Uh, or they would sort out by sound. So there is a belief among uh, fine piano makers that the, the acoustic quality of the wood of the shank has a contribution to the quality and it's worth paying attention to. Uh, I tend to sort by weight. It's just what I do, mm -hmm. but it works well enough. Thanks. Thank you. Um, it's Don Donnie from ages ago at North Bennett. Oh, a bird? Yep. <laughs> hey. Ask a dumb question and get a brilliant answer. <laughs> oh, well, the discussion really stim. I don't like to sit here and jabber. I like to engage. So thank you so much. Now I'm going to go back to, so we have this measurement now. We have a way to measure uh, hammers and getting the idea of their weight without taking the action apart. So I started to measure uh, and take data. And I had all my friends, mainly starting with the grad, my classmates at North Venice Street, I, I asked, I told them how to make this measurement. Hey, you can measure this thing, tip the hammer on the scale. You can take these measurements, send me the data. So I've got the study group sending me volumes of data. And if I go back to screen share, I'll show you what I did with that data. Okay. Okay, so we learned how to measure strike weight. And when I started out uh, taking measurements, I, I used something, maybe some of you remember this, but it's called graph paper. And I would use this thing called a pencil. <laughs> I would make graphs of these, this data. And I had a client that had an upright piano that wanted- We all know that those things don't exist, David, and we all- We've also know that the world is, we've learned that the world is also flat. We've so, been just. Uh, <laughs> I had, had a client with an upright needed rebuilding. Uh, we, I don't really have much business. I'm just starting out. And I said, well, maybe we could barter. What's your business? And he said, I sell computers. And I said, I don't think I need a computer. And he looked at me with this lovingly passionate feeling in his eyes. He said, I think you do. And I said, great. So I got the state of the art computer. It was a 500 megabyte hard drive. It was state of the art. And it, it's like, you can put the data in and it'll make graphs. And this is the program, which I still use. This is a DOS program I, that from the very beginning when I had that first computer in 1992, I think it was. Uh, and I started making graphs. So here, here's strike weights from several different kinds of pianos. This one on the bottom here is the play L. The 1845 play all. These are uh, somewhere I've got the keys, but they're all different kinds of pianos and makes of pianos. And what you can see is, well, you see that there is a trend uh, based to treble. They're obviously hammers are heavier in the bass and lighter in the treble. And I tried to delineate this uh, by measuring, these are just a few samples, but I literally had thousands. Uh, and I found that the normal zone of hammer weight, uh, tended to fall between these two lines. And you notice that they're not straight lines, they're curved. And they're curved because modern hammers tend to be tapered a little bit more in the treble. They start out heavy and then they, they taper the felt a little more. This is called the German taper. 
which by the way is not practiced anymore, according to Norbert Abel. So I delineated this, what I call the normal zone. Now in order to create a reference, in order to qualify hammer weight, we need to have a frame of reference. So we have a normal zone and you divide that normal zone into three zones. So you have here a low, medium and a high zone. So now you can look at this, at a hammer, let's say for note 40 with the red piano, this is in the medium, this is kind of in the middle of the medium zone. These ones are down near the low zone. This one is in the high zone. Now you can talk about quality of weight that relates to a quantity. The graph will tell you, or the spreadsheet will tell you what the quantity is. But when I look at a, a spreadsheet of numbers, I, have, I personally have a hard time. I think most people will look at numbers and only half of their brain is working, it's the left side. Uh, but when you look at a graph, the meaning becomes much greater. Now I divided each uh, of the zones into four subzones. You can see those scales there. Here they are missing, here they are back. So now we actually have, uh, I call these reference scales. They are scales. And in some cases they can actually be used as strike weight scales. Uh, but there are also cases where you may not want to go this light uh, in the treble unless you have an old play L. But modern hammers tend to come in uh, around here. But these, this is for reference and it also can be used uh, as a scale for actually spec specifications for strike weight. So I, we can use language now. And these scale numbers have a number. So you can look at a table and you can say, oh, scale number seven. Well, what's scale number seven? Well, that's in the middle of the medium zone. So we'll call that the half medium. Number nine would be top medium. You could say bottom high if you want, but I just say top and then quarter half. It's a, so we have a nomenclature now. I can talk to you and say, well, that's kind of a medium weight hammer. And now that means something. If I say, well, that's a 10 grand hammer, your mouth's gonna be kind of like, oh, okay, well, what's a 10 gram hammer? It's hard to think, but if you think visually and look at a graph and you say, well, that's the middle of the medium zone, then that starts to mean something. Now these, uh, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Obviously the German taper is not an animal. Oh, you're funny. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> oh God. Okay, now I just had a little, all right, this concert hall weight should be up here. Curve nine through 13 is kind of what I call concert hall weight. And I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, there's a reason that concert hammers are heavier. And just for reference in my uh, tables here, we have um, concert hall weight curves nine through 13. Now these tables are also available at standwithpiano.com, touch weight, HTM. So maybe I'll just go to that and show you. Uh, if you go to stand with piano, can you see all this? It's working? Yep, we can see it. So uh, here's my main page. You go down here, I got this. Piano Technicians resource page. It's got little things that are useful. And here we have um, hammer strike weight standards. And this is something you can print out. I would print it out on a legal. Uh, we have the nomenclature, we have the description of the measurements, and then we have the tables here. Now we have a strike weight curve standards and we have hammer weight curve standards. The hammer weight uh, curve standard is, strike weight minus 1.7, which is kind of an average uh, wooden hammer shanks strike weight. So you can actually, uh, if you're buying new hammers and measuring hammers and you wanna have an idea of what you're gonna end up with a strike weight, you can use the hammer weight side of the table uh, and for strike weight uh, is the left side of the table. Okay. 
Got it. Thanks. I put that link in the chat for people. Um, also, uh, one thing I would recommend if you're interested in my work here is just to go to this link, uh, PTT Journal Articles. You can uh, go through my description of the uh, my work over the years. So that's a good link to have. Uh, let's see now. Where are we? I'll go back to my. So I want to talk about the uh, relationship between weight and voice. So we we realize now that there's a lot of variations in weight, and how does that affect the voicing? When you talk about um, voicing, you have to know about wool. If you don't know about wool, then you don't you can't know about voicing because hammers are made of pure wool. And wool is a unique substance. That's why it's the only substance that we use to make hammers. And it's a fabulous material. And I, my wife uh, was a sheep shearer and we did a lot of wool processing. I learned a lot about industrial processes in wool when we're, we're traipsing around New England trying to get them to